2019. For today's webinar, we will be welcoming Dr. Kevin Harrison from the National Renewable Energy Lab, or NREL, to discuss a demonstration of biomethanation technology at NREL's campus in Golden, Colorado. Before we begin, I'd like to walk everyone through the GoToWebinar toolbar that should be visible to all attendees. Please enter any questions in the questions box. We'll review these during the Q&A session after the presentation. During the Q&A session, we will also open up the discussion for verbal questions. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, please click the raise hand icon to be called on during the Q&A session. When you are called on to ask a question, we will first grant you access to unmute, then you must manually unmute yourself, the legendary double unmute. Please go back on mute after asking your question. Finally, you'll find a few valuable documents in the handouts box. Before we begin, a comment on SoCal Gas's commitment to diversity. SoCal Gas is dedicated to improving the quality of life in diverse communities we serve. To support this commitment, SoCal Gas RD&D staff conduct outreach efforts and activities to engage with disadvantaged and underrepresented communities throughout California, notify researchers, entrepreneurs, and businesses about RD&D program funding opportunities, share the results from our D&D projects to inform and educate the general public. This webinar is just one of the ways we do this. And track and report progress in diversity, outreach efforts in our annual report. The SoCal Gas our D&D program is divided into five areas that span the entire energy supply chain. Low carbon resources, gas operations, clean transportation, clean generation, and customer end use applications. In 2020, the SoCal Gas RD&D team managed 386 active research projects. On average, RD&D projects generate a 6.9 times funding ratio, meaning for every dollar of RD&D funding provided to a project, the project also receives nearly $7 of external co-funding. For example, already in 2021, five RD&D projects have been awarded about $15 million from the California Energy Commission and the Department of Energy. For more details on the rd and program uh, are available in the 2020 annual report, which is included in your handouts today. This year, we also produced a Spanish version for the first time uh, to better connect with the diverse communities in our service territory. That's also included in the handouts. I'd also like to share with you two, uh, two more webinars we have coming up in the next few months. On October 10th, we will welcome a team from Sandia National Labs to share their work on materials-based hydrogen storage for heavy-duty vehicles. Then on November 4th, we will host researchers from UC Irvine to discuss a DOE-supported project looking at decarbonizing steel production with green hydrogen. Finally, we want to stay connected with our stakeholders in the research community and the general public. Please visit our webpage where you can find our annual report, information about our upcoming webinars, and news about the RD&D program. And please reach out to the RD&D team via email with questions, comments, or research suggestions. We also maintain an RD&D page on LinkedIn and on the CEC's research networking platform, Empower Innovation. Now, without further ado, I want to welcome Dr. Kevin Harrison from the National Renewable Energy Lab. Kevin, I'm really excited to hear about the story behind this technology, biomethanation. Tell us all about it. I will. Um, thank you, Matt. And I, I know you're being nice because you know all about this when we traveled to uh, Electrokea a few years back. So. Um, Hopefully, we can give you some new information. Does that screen come up for you, Matt? You should be all set. Okay. Excellent. Let me go to here. <clears throat> okay. Um, as Matt said, this particular webinar focuses on an RD&D project um, that NREL and SoCal Gas and Electrokea 
started um, a few years back where we brought, uh, shown on the screen, a 25 foot tall bioreactor that's on the left hand side of the screen at NREL just north of the building I work in, the Energy Systems Integration Facility. And it's been a team effort uh, by no small task to bring this system and nutrition skid, which is on the uh, closer to us in the picture and all the hydrogen storage is part of ongoing research in not only hydrogen production inside, but compression, storage, utilization, fueling of vehicles, light duty and heavy duty. So this is our, our outdoor test pad that you're looking at. And um, Nancy Dow is the microbiologist of the project. So any questions at the end, Matt, we might have to unmute Nancy if um, any of microbiologists decide to try to trip me up on any tricky questions. Nancy will have the answer. But it, it's been a great opportunity to work with SoCal Gas Electrica and a growing number of utilities across the nation from Summit in Maine to Jonah in Wyoming. These are all utilities at the forefront of looking at biomethanation as a, a way to make renewable natural gas. And um, so I wanted to share with you a little bit of the history uh, with this research project and walk down this outline under understanding the technology. Some people might not know what biomethanation is. I'll give a little hydrogen primer because um, that's really my role in this project is all about hydrogen production. And, uh, and I really grabbed onto this project early when Ron Kent came to me. Um, the idea of turning waste into energy is a powerful notion for me, whether it's a, at a landfill, wastewater treatment plant, we're going to be talking about these biogas sites. And renewable electricity, there's a slide. Um, what's enabling this technology to compete with other RNG production technologies, namely gas separation, for example? Talk a little bit about accomplishments because we've made a lot of, uh, lot of progress in the last few years in this space market potential and and people always want to know, well, how much does it cost? So some on economics. So a little bit about the project history and the SoCal Gas Vision. I, I think most people that are tuning in today uh, realize that SoCal Gas is a leader in working to decarbonize their natural gas supply. And in 2019, it came as no surprise really that they want to provide 20 percent of their traditional natural gas with rng and biomethanation is one way to uh, help accomplish that so on the right hand side the project started off in 2014 with the solar energy technology office at, at doe we partnered with electrokea who provided the organism and the process controls to keep the organisms happy and productive so we designed a system uh, reviewed it, installed it, commissioned it at NREL, and NREL sees a lot of promise in what we call here at NREL electrons to molecules. So it, it's been supported internally, uh, where we received some internal strategic funding to winterize and, and make sure we can operate the system uh, throughout the year. So then came the Biopower Project which is another collaboration with DOE, the Bioenergy Technology Office, SoCal Gas and Electrokea. So now we're looking at going to biogas sites, actually doing field trials with a scaled down small mobile reactor. And then after that, we um, have been actively innovating on systems integration. So this EB, what we call the EBI, Electrolyzer Bioreactor Integration Project, um, brings in multiple programs, brought in the Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Technology Office, as well as BETO, SoCal Gas are all co-funding to reduce to practice some of the IP that Nancy and I have developed in this space between the electrolyzer and the bioreactor. Not really focused on the organisms and the process to keep them happy and healthy, that's Electric Chaos role, but we're designing this smaller 15 kilowatt electrolyzer system that will move around and we could be at a wastewater treatment plant in New York City one month, a dairy in Maine, um, uh, food waste in California. I think there's a lot of opportunities to have this mobile flexible research platform on wheels, quite literally, to move around the country and help certify this process within the carbon markets.
So here, here's an overview. Most people will recognize that I pulled apart um, the hydrogen at scale bubble chart a little bit to insert to show where these biogenic CO2 waste streams fit in. So if we want to be at, at um, any of those listed, we would need hydrogen. So hydrogen, this two-step process is about upgrading CO2 using renewable hydrogen. The biocatalysts do the work. Um, so for every CO2 that comes in, you see the equation at the top. Uh, CH4 comes out, it produce, the organisms produce two water per molecule of carbon in and also heat. So it's exothermic, so we have to reject some heat. So this is a once again, an opportunity to make a drop-in direct replacement for fossil natural gas that has no material compatibility issues, has the same energy density, that, um, the heating values are the same between a, a renewable molecule and a what I call a fossil natural gas molecule, for example. And we have this existing network to utilize to start decarbonizing the natural gas grid, much like we've been doing um, over the past decades in decarbonizing the electricity grid. So some people may not realize that the natural gas grid carries two to three times as much energy as the electricity grid. So decarbonizing this tremendous asset um, that contains millions of miles of pipeline goes to most homes and businesses, has underground storage capability. And then we're starting to look at some of the the benefits on the right. So now you're coupling the natural gas network uh, to the electricity network, enabling higher penetrations of renewables in the process. It's a long duration energy storage play where it may take over for batteries in, in moving energy in time from hours and days to weeks and months and seasons perhaps. So terawatt hour scale geological storage. It has a Methane has um, an energy density, volumetric energy density, roughly three times that of hydrogen alone. So you're, you're not trading um, heating value of, of the product inside the pipelines. It recycles greenhouse gases that would be otherwise emitted. So if the baseline for dairies, for example, is to um, have an open pit and the methane and CO2 are emitted into the air, you can see back to the graphic for a second, um, this biogas mix, which is created when anything decomposes, it contains about 40% CO2 and 60% methane. So normally, um, and we'll get into carbon intensities and, and why certain things are more carbon neutral, carbon negative than others. And it's based on the baseline. What do we do today? So. I mentioned that it's a drop in direct replacement, so that's a valuable starting point in this transition that could start today. We have all the tools. Um, many utilities like SoCal Gas and the other partners I mentioned have the desire to decarbonize. So we have the tools today and we're conducting research to de-risk and reduce costs and you'll see a lot of our IPs focused on that. So, and one little plug on the, the organisms, um, they're naturally occurring. Inside the bioreactor is basically seawater. So uh, they're self-replicating, naturally occurring organisms. So it, if this were to spill, for example, and we've never done that, of, of course, um, but you're essentially spilling seawater. So this is a slide I, I borrowed from Electrokea with permission, and it shows the two steps, starting with electrolysis, um, the splitting apart of water, preferably using low carbon, um, low cost electricity into hydrogen and oxygen. Typically, the oxygen is vented. Um, it's one of those things that uh, people involved with electrolysis always wring our hands about, like, how can we use the oxygen? Well, we don't use it in this process. This is an anaerobic process. Step two is an anaerobic process where the organisms um, can tolerate a little oxygen, for example, but um, normally we just we, we just vent the oxygen from the electrolyzer, of course. So that hydrogen um, meets up with a carbon dioxide source. So today we're looking at and talking about biogas sources, these waste streams and turning them into energy, but any CO2 will do. 
here at NREL, we have CO2 delivered because we don't have a biogas source close. So we have we start with pure CO2. So now let your imagination run to other fermentation processes like breweries and ethanol plants and things that make and release CO2. This same process can turn those CO2s into biomethane, renewable natural gas, that CH4 you see on the second equation, water and heat. So the organisms do the work. So they are living organisms, they're single-celled, um, that go back millions of years, and I talked about how they're sustainable and self-replicating. So it's a it's a strong argument to use biology um, and and this electrolysis process to uh, recycle CO2 and and reuse it. And I think I covered most of those. Electrokea owns this particular strain of Archaea, and um, Nancy and I have shown, and you will see that we these organisms load follow. I, I've talked previously, if you've ever heard me talk before, about how electrolyzers are very grid-friendly electrical loads. And then if you're talking about tens of megawatts worth of electrolysis on the grid, now you have sort of a dispatchable load that can follow the wind and solar because you can change the power to the electrolyzer very quickly. Well, the organisms are load following as well. So we... Um, slow down gases, gas flow rates, and increase them, and the organisms pick up and drop off as the gases are available. So I, I think that's a very important um, opportunity when you're thinking about coupling with wind and solar that, of course, are, are naturally varying. So the Hydrogen at Scale initiative came out of the Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Technology Office. Um, it's an initiative that involves many national labs, including NREL, and it's this idea of moving these electrons, these low carbon electrons on the left to the electricity grid. I don't spend much time talking about conventional storage like batteries um, because this is a, either a, a longer term energy storage solution, seasonal energy storage, super large scale. We, you know, we talked about terawatt level, terawatt hour level energy storage. So uh, moving to hydrogen uh, gives you a lot of flexibility. And in my opinion, enables higher penetration of renewables. You can see sort of the benefits of renewable hydrogen that I like to um, to state. So where does this project fit with SoCal Gas and Electrokea? It's really in the sy synthetic fuels place, right? One of those blue bubbles on the right, where most of the hydrogen today, that 10 million metric tons, goes into ammonia and upgrading oil to gasoline. But we're, th we're talking about using hydrogen not only for transportation in places like California and growing across the globe, opportunities to use fuel cells in not only material handling, handling uh, for forklifts, for example, but light duty vehicles. And here at NREL, looking at um, pushing the envelope with heavy duty uh, fueling infrastructure work that we're doing it in the same spot out near the, the bioreactor. So being able to circle back into the, the gas infrastructure, that's why the arrow points to all these millions of miles of st um, pipeline and storage. It's a, it's a powerful message in my opinion. And, and, and it continues. If you're moving energy, um, batteries have a place, uh, compressed air storage, pump storage, all those uh, are very valuable ways of storing energy, but fit into different time frames. You know, for example, you could extend that battery uh, rectangle to the right, but there is a place where it becomes uneconomical. And here at NREL, we really focus, one of the places we focus, me in particular, um, is in the space of electrons to molecules. So turning it into hydrogen and other products, not just methane, but sustainable av aviation fuel, renewable diesel, where there's CO2 and hydrogen, you can make a lot of different things from those feedstocks. Um, so moving to the right, you are staring, uh, looking at um, more and more energy and up the, the y-axis, um, longer discharge times when you store that energy sort of in molecule form, if you will. And SoCal Gas, that blue call out box on the bottom, um, provides a data point for how much storage you know, SoCal gas has already in the ground. And I like to point out that moving a carbon into the discussion to make methane 
at 250 bar, for example, or LNG, you're sort of moving up the volumetric energy density chart from methane at 250 bar, um, which is a very typical uh, fueling pressure, uh, has a higher volume volumetric energy density than even liquid um, hydrogen, for example, let alone at the top, you're looking at diesel and jet fuel and things like that. So that's really the focus is on the vertical axis and showing that lower right picture. I think it's a something I remind myself all the time is um, moving from low BTU value uh, gases to higher energy density products and fuels. So there are about 22 operational biogas systems in the US and there's 2200 that are using the CO2 and methane perhaps to combust and make electricity for, for local consumption at a farm or something like that or using the, the gas combination. They're not separating the gases in these 2200 all the time um, for heat. So you can combust it for heat. 157 of these biogas systems um, are doing gas separation. So they're splitting, they're separating the methane from the CO2 and you can see some of the numbers there. 100, over 100 of them are injecting back into the natural gas network by using gas separation technologies. And moving to the right, um, a lot of that RNG will go into the transportation sector. So showing the number of CNG and LNG fueling stations across the US, all those blue dots, um, what's planned and, and roughly how many vehicles um, are on the road. And then finally on the lower right, this is where this project separates itself. RNG produced by recycling the CO2 content in biogas would in basically double, roughly double, improve by 60 to 70% um, the RNG production from that biogas because you're not letting the CO2 go. So you keep the RNG, you keep the methane, you upgrade the CO2, use renewable hydrogen. So that lower box separates itself from gas separation. We're talking about for the rest of this presentation, upgrading the CO2. And what is an enabler? What's what, Why is this happening? Highlighting low cost PV utility scale there in the center in the three to four cent per kilowatt hour looking at wind. So it's really the, the idea of low cost, low carbon electrons driving the electrolyzer, um, which is making this discussion about power to gas, power to X, uh, gas to liquids, electrons to molecules, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> A lot of it starts here. Uh, with the electricity costs, because if you're not down here in this one to three, one to four cent range, um, the hydrogen is more expensive and, and tougher to sell these projects. And I want to highlight nuclear um, in sort of that orange color. That's the marginal cost I included um, from the Lazard site. Uh, the the script there that says represents the midpoint of the marginal cost of operating a depreciated. Where if you look at the dark blue, those would be new systems, where the orange on the left are de fully depreciated systems. That's the difference. So wind and solar, nuclear, um, fossil with carbon capture and things like that. The idea of having low carbon hydrogen is important. So I spoke with um, Blue Source this morning to, to make sure I had full understanding of this because they did a nice job of sort of laying out the biogas sources on the left, what, what you could get for them, not their production cost, not how much it costs to make, but how much they're valued in the existing carbon markets. So this slide takeaway is not to focus on the commodity price. It's really looking at the existing carbon markets the renewable fuel standards, uh, renewable fuel standard from uh, the federal system and then California's low carbon uh, fuel standard on the right. So getting this biomethanation process certified and able to participate in these carbon markets is, is really what Nancy and myself and, and Ron Kent and, and Electrokea and uh, other utilities that I, that I mentioned, like Summit and Jonah, getting this process certified to participate so that this biomethanation can be deployed. 
um, sooner is really the takeaway from, from this particular slide. Um, so I, I did want to show you where and the capabilities we here we have here at NREL. We designed and built uh, the PEM electrolyzer balance of plants shown on the left. So it's nominally a one megawatt system, can provide up to 4,000 amps, 250 volts. It's, unless you're an electrical engineer, you might not care about that. But today we're running a 750 kilowatt PEM stack from one of our partners, produces about 13 kilograms of hydrogen per hour. And the hydrogen pressure um, is something, so 30 bar or roughly you know, 450 PSI is, is something we continually work to make sure we can keep up with Nell hydrogen and plug power as hydrogen pressures increase out of their stacks. So getting that pressure right out of the stack is a pretty powerful thing because what we can do now is take that pressure right into the bioreactor. Gives you a little head start. There's no mechanical compression between that stack shown and the bioreactor, for example. There doesn't have to be because the bioreactor shown on the right number three operates at 260 PSI or 18 bar. So we already have the head pressure right out of the stack, electrochemically compressed by the stack. So you're paying a small energy price um, to feed that hydrogen, not only to a compressor, and we've got multiple diaphragm piston compressors and we've done research on that. I did mention the light duty vehicles and the heavy duty vehicle at 350 and 700 bar. Uh, dispensing work we do. Um, NREL is, is a leader, uh, surely, in that space, and we continue to push the envelope in that. And we have a lot of storage to the tune of over 600 kilograms today at different pressures, 200, 400, 900 bar. So that gives you a feel for some of the capabilities we have. And the work we conducted on, the, on number three in the middle is that what we refer to as the SoCal gas bioreactor, uh, running with electrochaea technology, which is basically the organism and the process uh, to feed the organism and keep it happy. So another uh, accomplishment from this project is increasing the pressure of the bioreactor uh, up to 18 bar. So electrochaea operates their facilities. They have two of them in Europe. Uh, they go up to nine or 10 bar. We designed this system to go to 18 bar. So this snapshot of data shows the uh, impact in, in increasing pressure. And increasing pressure allows more gases, forces more gases to be dissolved. And that's the key. The organisms need the dissolved gases. They can't grab onto bubbles floating by. The gas needs to be dissolved. So in this particular uh, graph we show increasing from five to six bar and then to seven bar and then ultimately increasing agitation uh, really improved the conversion and the conversion is basically a measure of how much CO2 is left. So that bottom gray, those bottom gray uh, markers show the CO2 dropping to nearly zero once we increase the agitation. So gas mass transfer, in particular hydrogen. Hydrogen has a low solubility in water. So getting hydrogen to the organisms and dissolved in the solution is, is really one of the research focuses uh, Nancy and I uh, have been looking at, ways to do it cheaper and better so that the organisms can be productive and convert nearly all of that CO2 so that coming out of the bioreactor, you have 97% Methane, for example, very little CO2 left over, very little um, hydrogen, of course. So uh, I mentioned the IP, and this is another uh, output from this project. And we've submitted to, um, we've, we've worked past the provisional to the non-provisional stage. And our focus is really on systems integration, reducing costs, de-risking this two-step process, making hydrogen and then making renewable natural gas. So you can see some of the impacts uh, of the IP in this space. And, and we have entered into an, a licensing agreement with, with SoCal Gas for the first one. And um, the second one shown there, where we're looking at hydrogen mass flow and gas ratio control, uh, doing that a little more elegantly and uh, reducing expensive um, Coriolis mass flow meters, for example, uh, are some of the improvements of, of that second particular patent shown here. 
And then I think this helps tell the story. Earlier, I had a number um, that I didn't mention, but it was 35 or 13,000, roughly 13,000. And if you look at the dark green uh, bar charts, we have about 40 um, gas separation, well, 40 particular facilities using biogas from waste food. And then you see the landfill gas, livestock, and wastewater treatment. Those looking at the dark green, those are operational. And here's the potential for the, the remaining, sort of the technical market potential of other biogas systems, roughly a thousand more could be installed at food waste, for example, landfill. So if you do just sort of back of the envelope, adding those up, those add up to about 13,000 more opportunities to ultimately, I think, RNG could replace around 10% of the natural gas this this country uses every year. So that's book in, bookending the problem. I think that is the ultimate market potential is, is decarbonizing roughly 10% with biogas sources only. It doesn't include other CO2. And then I show on the right, uh, in 2019, I was quite impressed by this infographic that already 40% of um, the RNG used in California as fuel comes from renewable natural gas. I think that's uh, a good achievement, but also shows a lot of opportunity to replace uh, the conventional natural gas further with RNG. And I borrowed that from the RNG coalition and um, the other references are shown there. So where do we go from here? The system at NREL is nominally one to 200 kilowatt. And what does that mean? That means we have, um, at the time the system was designed, we had 125 kilowatt electrolyzer. So that's what we sort of designed the bioreactor around. Now Electrokea is moving to megawatt uh, system designs, tens of megawatts of system design. This shows a one megawatt electrical input and that's a one megawatt electrical input to the electrolyzer. The resulting gas flow of hydrogen, 200 normal cubic meters per hour of hydrogen. And the other feedstock is from a biogas source. 50 normals from uh, of CO2 and the 75 that pass through the bioreactor uh, of methane. So in the middle is the bioreactor containing the organisms. That's where these mix, this mixed gas flows into and the organisms upgrade just the CO2. So by the time you reach the right-hand side, you have 97, 98% pure methane, achieving the higher the, the heating values you need for direct injection after a little water cleanup, of course, and maybe a little hydrogen sulfide cleanup. Um, at the edge of this reactor is pipeline quality methane. It also produces about 160 kilowatts worth of heat. I mentioned it's exothermic. So these organisms, uh, when they're metabolizing the gases are also releasing heat, so you need a cooling. Um, but I think one of the takeaways I like to point out on this slide is that for a one megawatt electrolyzer, you only have probably three electric motors on the bioreactor. At the top of that tall cylinder is an agitator motor. Um, somewhere in there is a circulation pump to move the culture through a heat exchanger to reject that 160 kilowatts of heat, and then perhaps a heating, uh, a cooling pump on the water glycol side. So the takeaway is, out of the one megawatt, do you have another 100 kilowatts worth of, of pumps and controls embedded in that bioreactor? That might be about right. 90% or more of the power goes into hydrogen production very little, less than 10% of the energy of the system goes into the bioreactor. So most of it goes to making hydrogen and step two, making the methane um, less than 10%. So a little bit about the economics. This is a TA that we did, this, um, this gradient chart uh, with electricity price along the bottom. So looking at the far lower left, that's free electricity. And then you have one, two, three cents per kilowatt hour. And then on the y-axis, you have the CO2 credits, uh, whether it's the LCFS or combined with RFS, things like that. This is a scenario where we're looking at electrolyzer costs that have essentially been cut in half. 
and the productivity of the organisms have reached uh, a pretty good level. Um, fermentation, microbiologists will understand what the 20 grams of, of methane per liter hour. But the goal here is to, to be down here and be competitive with other RNG production pathways. So you need to be less than three cents per kilo hour and have some level of uh, carbon credit. And then if you wanna be less than $10, between five and $10 per MMBTU, I've seen TEA in that range. Um, you need to start with zero to two cent per kilowatt hour electricity and, and have carbon credits. Basically going back to the enabler slides where we talked about electricity prices and carbon markets. So it is doable. We have a pathway to achieve that and, um, and be competitive with RNG uh, production. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time reading this, but it probably doesn't surprise anyone seeing me talk. I'm very excited about this because um, it recycles CO2 from our waste streams and puts it to a good use. It avoids greenhouse gases that might otherwise be emitted, but of course get combusted later and um, the methane turns back into CO2. So, you know, the carbon neutrality of this is a start. It is part of the solution, provides long duration energy storage for, for renewables today. All this can be done today. Um, biomethanation in particular would double the methane production versus gas separation technologies. Uh, NREL goal there, I explained that well enough. But I mean, thank you uh, for allowing me to present this sort of like on behalf, right, of SoCal Gas, because they're our partner in Electrokea, but also working with these other progressive um, utilities like Summit and Jonah. Uh, there's gonna be a you know field project out there somewhere, and it's um, looking like some of these early uh, adopters will be hosting that, and, and I suspect NREL and Electrokea will be involved. So thank you to, to all of our partners, including Dr. Metz at the University of Chicago, Nancy Dow again, starting to work looking at uh, compression and sundine. And so we're reaching out to all aspects of, of this process. And um, I think that is where I'll end it, uh, showing a picture of Ron and Doris in 2019 when we fully commissioned this. Uh, thanks again to DOE for supporting this work and, and Ron and Doris. So thank you all. And I'll leave you on this slide um, with uh, ways to get a hold of Nancy and myself. And that's where I'm going I'm to end it, Matt. Excellent. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, great presentation. And we've got some questions in the questions box for the, for, uh, the audience. If you have any questions for Kevin, uh, please enter them into the into the question box. Let's start off with this one from Heather Marinda. Will these systems be proposed to address the governor's five emergency natural gas power plants? Kevin, I don't know if you've heard, this is a little bit of California local news, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, Governor Newsom has proposed five uh, temporary natural gas plants to avoid uh, power shutoffs um, in the coming years uh, during hot weather. Uh, so I think, this technology is really about producing more renewable natural gas that could end up powering those natural gas peaker plants or those natural gas facilities to provide uh, renewable power. But also there's an energy storage play here, right? It's, it's yeah. taking that excess renewable electricity that we produce in California in the spring in particular, converting it into natural gas or renewable natural gas so we can store it until we need it during those hot summer months everybody's running their their air conditioners am i on the right track there i think that sounded like a good answer i wouldn't have had anything more but yeah you're right this is a uh, an rng production technology and uh, it sounds like the, the question surrounds uh, producing electricity from natural gas so yeah this would be a feedstock for that combustion cycle uh, from Krishna Nand, do we have to clean the biogas from the landfill or can it be used as is? That, that's a great question. And, and it's some a, a question for Electrokea. I th it really depends on what's coming out of your landfill. Some pre-cleanup um, could be necessary 
to avoid things like siloxanes that come off of landfills and you would not want to put that into your your biology inside the reactor so it really depends on what's coming off i think there is a, a decent chance you would need some uh, gas cleanup before the biomethanation so you don't put anything in the reactor that would harm the culture did you look at all at sensitivity to hydrogen sulfide that's another key uh, contaminant in uh, ad or biogas it is yeah so electrica has um, a project in copenhagen denmark that's uh, where we were right matt and ron joined us and and nancy and i were over there from what I understand, that anaerobic digester puts off um, 1,000 ppm H2S. And the good news is the organisms need a sulfur source. Well, all living things need a sulfur source. So having hydrogen sulfide in the feedstock um, to a certain degree should not be a problem. And I think um, that's a question that Doris will answer with uh, you know better fidelity of of their experience with hydrogen sulfide but in general we feed the organisms uh, sodium sulfide for example um, so the hydrogen sulfide is um, would be tolerated to a certain extent all right um from giovanni castano why do you need to run biomethane through the reactor do you need to run biomethane through the reactor? I don't think so. Yeah. You can you, you can use this in a couple of different ways, right? You could, um, but I think you would be spending a lot of extra capital to separate the gas into the, your, your CO2 and methane. That, that costs a lot of money. Um, the gas separation technology you know, is capital intensive, just like this process where you have to buy an electrolyzer and a bioreactor. So would you split the gases, so then feed the CO2 into the bioreactor and then let the methane go into the natural gas pipeline a little bit sooner? You could do that, but this process can accommodate the methane flowing through. You don't have to flow through, but why would you separate it um, just to recombine it, you know, on the other side of the bioreactor? The organisms don't care about the methane floating by. They grab the CO2s. So you don't have to separate, but I suppose you could. So if you're at a gas separation project, could you put a bioreactor on the CO2 uh, stream and upgrade that CO2? Yes. You've sunk in the cost into the gas separation and you want to do something about the CO2 at the biogas uh, RNG facility uh, where they have gas separation technology? Sure, you could do that. Well, thinking about the future, potentially looking at CO2 pipelines, you know, from other carbon capture projects and moving that CO2, we could deliver the CO2 to the bioreactor in a pure form. So Absolutely. kind of decoupling the, the CO2 source from the RNG production. That's uh, right. And, but the, it sounds like the, the, the biology can accommodate it either way. I think that was part of, you know, part of the experimentation here was sort of what's the impact of that methane and it sounds like it's, it's a spectator right it just passes through yeah that, that's that's a good way to put it matt all right let's see what is the current scale of the bioreactor biomethane production capacity per day Mm. Uh, the, the the SoCal gas bioreactor has a design point of 125 kilowatt electro of electrolysis, um, which I believe is about 2.7 kilograms of hydrogen per hour. I think at that design point, you make about four standard cubic feet per minute of methane if I'm remembering correctly. That is something um, that we started to work on here at NREL and we'll continue to push how much gas can, can this reactor actually take when we achieve 18 bar. So when we ultimately double the pressure of where electric K is at, um, can we actually handle more than the design point is really some of the future work we hope to accomplish. And I think 
you know, looking at this reactor, scaling it up, how difficult is it? It's basically a tower tank contactor reactor, right? I mean, yeah, it's tall and the skinny. The actual process flow is, yeah, pretty yeah. straightforward. Yeah, you can see it in the behind over uh, Nancy's right shoulder. That's 18 inches in diameter and about 18 foot tall. You can see the agitator, the five horsepower agitator motor at the top and some diagnostic ports coming out the sides and stuff like that. Um, and then there's a little bit of gas cleanup afterwards. Uh, for example, you would need to dry it and, and knock out any H2S that remains to make sure you meet pipeline quality specs. In California, I think that's rule 30, which includes a heating value. So we don't wanna to leave too much hydrogen in there uh, to reduce uh, the heating value below sort of nominally 970. Um, so I, I think, yes, Electric K is working on scaling. Um, we're here at 700 liter, which is about 200 gallons. And we're gonna be using this research reactor as much as we can because it's a huge investment. And we feel very honored <laughs> that SoCal Gas and DOE continue to believe in us and our work. Um, to de-risk de and drop costs. So we're gonna continue to get use out of this, uh, so what we call the SoCal gas bioreactor in the background behind us. Yeah, you know, and then thinking about scaling up, one of the one of the things I got excited about this topic uh, recently was the news that Baker Hughes had made a significant mm. investment in Electric K. And Baker Hughes, for the audience, if you don't know, is, is a pretty large infrastructure company that's, that basically builds these kinds of projects. Uh, so thinking about scaling up, you know, they they now have a partner that can really build these things uh, at much larger scales than the kilowatt scale we're looking at here, right? We're thinking multiple megawatts in the future. That's probably. right. Matt, that's exactly right. Here we're looking at hundreds of kilowatts uh, and Electric A has done that in Europe as well. We're looking now perhaps going to a megawatt, 10 megawatts. I've heard people say, the words 50 megawatts worth of electrolysis um, for for biomethanation to make RNG. So it's scalable. Not only is the electrolyzer scalable, and you can talk to um, Nell Hydrogen and Plug Power about their plans for scaling electrolysis, and that's happening today. Yes, you can scale these bioreactors. Where's the tipping point where you don't want to make it any bigger? Is it five megawatts, 10 megawatts? Um, Electrokea is working on that answer. Great. So uh, next question from Nadia Richards on slide 14 for the bar chart. I don't know if you want to scroll back. Why is the landfill gas potential the only one that is lower than the operational bar? Um, I, I think that has to do with technical feasibility of um, deploying this at another 400 landfills. There are much more than a thousand landfills in the US. Um, I'll take a stat, maybe there's 3,500. So in total, there's a lot more landfills, but this particular study looked at the technical feasibility of deploying it. Um, there's gonna be some landfills that you just can't do it at. Um, so there's been 650 that have been deployed with another 400 that they feel are reasonably ready uh, for, for a biogas upgrading to RNG system. Right. And I, I provide, um, provide the link there to, um, to read more about it. Thanks. Uh, Here's another California question. Can this technology help uh, California cities who are facing SB 1383 issues? This is legislation that is mandating that cities collect and separate their organic waste streams. Um, so I think what, we, what this legislation will likely lead to is more of these types of anaerobic digestion projects, more biogas projects, and anywhere you have a biogas project, you have a CO2 source that you could That's potentially right. convert into additional RNG using this technology. Yeah, I think separating food waste is a, is a good idea from a citizen of the planet perspective. Um, and then, like you said, Matt, uh, that would go into an anaerobic digester. 
um, and then the decomposition of that food waste would turn into the CO2 and methane, the biogas that we've been talking about uh, throughout the presentation. So I think it's a good idea. Um, and, and certainly the particular study shown still on 14 says there's roughly a thousand, um, that's with no new ones added. There's existing about a thousand places where the potential exists to do this today. Yeah, and I think getting getting back to your point on landfill gas, uh, landfill gas is really hard to deal with. You know, it's, it's, an, it's sort of an uncontrolled bioreactor, uh, you know, deep in the ground. Whereas right. if you can get this into a food waste processing center or a wastewater treatment center where you've got a controlled anaerobic digestion system, you're going to get cleaner biogas that's easier to deal with and easier to uh, convert into a useful product. That's exactly right. Um, you want to give my you want to give my next presentation, Matt. You're doing a great <laughs> job. Um, here's a here's an interesting question about inoculation. Uh, mm -hmm. What was the inoculation process? <laughs> I should let Nancy answer this, and but um, I'll take a stab at it. Since I inoculated the reactor shown in those pictures, it was according to Nancy, um, not necessarily her words. But surprisingly um, easy and forgiving. <laughs> this is just a, a little story because I think we have a, a minute. But Electrikea shipped over the inoculum, the culture, in jerry cans, the same jerry cans that you might put diesel fuel or normal gasoline or water or something like that. So we received on a skid these jerry cans and before they shipped them, well, they filled it with the, the culture, of course, and put a little nitrogen uh, purge head on it. And that's what I did to inoculate. I, I stuck a tube into the jerry can while I was providing a little nitrogen uh, purge into the headspace, and I pumped the culture into the reactor. It was surprisingly easy and, and very satisfying. Um, I did it, I mean, Nancy should have been the one doing it, but I think she was out of town on travel or something giving a presentation. But anyways, it was pretty straightforward. And since they're self-replicating, you always have inoculum for the next reactor or if something were to go wrong. So you're they're always making more of themselves. And if you do remove some of the culture, um, they go dormant at room temperature. So at 20 C, they're dormant. At 60 C, um, they're productive. So they cool down and they can, and I think Doris told me this, um, those jerry cans set around for a couple years before they shipped them to us. She can correct me if I oversold that, but I think they sat around and they came back to life and then you saw some of the data. It was so cool. And, and Nancy has a full appreciation of the biology here and I'm just learning of course, but it was really neat. Yeah, I remember seeing those jerry cans in in the lab in Munich, just sitting on the in the corner, you know, not in yeah. a refrigerator or anything. It's, yeah, it's so neat. Pretty amazing to use bio. Yeah, and is it, to use biology in this sort of this energy transformation, turning CO two back into useful energy and for energy storage and transportation and heat and everything like that is is really cool. Uh, next question is a common one in this space, thinking about water. So uh, looking at the, at the mass balance in your equations, you've got water, four moles of water being used and just two being produced. How do you think water shortages in California might impact this system? Yeah, I, I'm very sensitive to the water um, discussion because I, I think it's a very important one. And yeah, starting with electrolysis, um, requires not only potable water, but if you're using PEM electrolysis, requires a certain level of deionization, purity. Um, and it's not always easy to achieve that level of purity for PEM electrolysis, um, but it's doable. And I think the water budget yeah, so it takes about two and a half gallons of water to produce a kilogram of hydrogen. Another rule of thumb for people taking notes. And that kilogram of hydrogen has roughly the same energy content as, as a gallon of gasoline. We all sort of know what a gallon of gasoline can do for us. So a kilogram uh, on an energy basis 
is roughly equivalent to a gallon of gasoline. So we call it a GGE or a kilogram. Um, so the water budget, that two and a half or 2.6 gallons of water to make that kilogram or gallon of, gas, gallon of gasoline equivalent is not a bad budget when you compare it with making gasoline and things like that. But, but it is going to be site specific and region specific and, and it is something that you can't just gloss over in my opinion. The availability of water, I hear arguments internally here at NREL that says, well, water it doesn't even add a penny to the cost of your kilogram of hydrogen. That's not the point, in my opinion. Water availability and then making it pure enough um, to run a PEM electrolyzer is not as easy as it sounds. And we do it here at NREL. We're, we're feeding a 750 kilowatt electrolyzer. We're almost at a 5,000 hour uh, runtime, which is the duration of a, this long duration um, operations for our client. We're almost to five. And water quality has been one of the biggest reasons of downtime. If you let water quality go, it drops below the required level. The system shuts off, and you sort of have to flush your system of all the of all the water that doesn't meet spec and start over. It has burned us more than once. All right. Um, comment from Hideo Watanabe at Osaka Gas. Um, methanation is the center of their interest at the Japanese gas utility, and they've been pushing the Japanese government hard to incorporate it, and it looks like they've had some success. So they're looking, they're interested in collaborating with us and you on uh, methanation for RNG production. So just interesting to see that this, I know we, you know, the, a lot of this work with Electric has started in Europe, bringing it to That's the right. U.S., but it does have applications sort of globally. That's right. Um, question from Flavio de Cruz. What happens if there's carbon monoxide coming into the system? Do you need to take that off from the feed gas? Mm. Yeah, another um, gas purity question. I'm not sure... A, where the carbon monoxide would come from. Um, if you're at a biogas source, uh, but I think that's a question for Electric A and I, and I don't want to say, um, I, I have not heard in conversations with Electric A over the years, any concerns with CO coming off of wastewater or, or things like that, or any of the projects they're looking at. So it, it might be a non-issue because it, may not sort of naturally occur in CO, and I could be wrong on that. I'm not a biogas Doris, anaerobic digestion. Doris chimed in and said CO is, is tolerated but not utilized. Correct. Thanks, tolerated, Doris. Tolerated but not utilized. Excellent so I feel answer. Some... Yeah, the organisms yeah. are tough. They're very robust. They can handle some contaminants. Thanks for answering, Doris. Uh, from Jim Jarzal, uh, because of the heat being produced in the bioactivity, would this system be a self-heating system that would prevent effects from cold weather, sort of like what happened in Texas? Or would the system shut down, assuming it was too cold? Um, you want to protect these systems from freezing. Um, so on one of my slides, NREL provided some strategic fund to winterize so basically insulate and heat trace all the systems because if you're not running and you, you drop in, you know, down to freezing, you will, like any system filled with mostly water or seawater or whatever it is, you will just start destroying equipment and bursting pipes. So you want to protect it from freezing if the freezing potential exists and, and if it can't run. But to, it, to the question, um, it does produce heat that heat has to be removed. Um, and in the meantime, it will be keeping itself warm. You also have an electrolyzer operating at 60 to 80 degrees C that's providing some heat. So you have this heat. Um, can it be used? It's, it's relatively, I guess, what people call low grade heat. Um, I think there's probably uses for it. But yes, it would keep itself warm, but you still have to winterize it, if you will to protect it from freezing.
Does it ever get cold in Golden, Colorado? Yes. Yeah, that's that drove us to um, insulate and heat trace every stainless steel tube, every vessel. Um, and on this picture, you can see right behind Ron, um, a lot of those blankets and the aluminum cladding, that's after we had the system, um, what I call winterized, so it doesn't freeze. You have to protect this this equipment. Uh, okay, so from uh, Julio Robles, would your system be able to include an atmospheric water generator, which would create water from humidity? Um, yes, but um, we, the only thing I would change is um, the atmospheric part, since these reactors are operating um, between you know, at electric nine to 10 bar um, and the SoCal gas up to 18 bar, since you're operating in, in that pressure, the water and the gases inside are at that pressure. So, you know, water cleanup is, is something electric is looking at, NREL is looking at to retain organisms, to retain nutrients inside the reactor while pulling out the water is, is an active area of interest because you don't want to be flushing um, two gallons or 20 gallons of culture out down the drain every hour, for example. Um, you'd want to let the water go and maybe recycle that back to the electrolyzer after a little bit of cleanup. But you want to retain the organisms and nutrients in the reactor as much as possible. So the water cleanup is, like is an interesting thing. Sorry, he's, he clarified water. The water is for the electrolyzer. Yeah, you can ultimately take the water out of the reactor through a cleanup process, whether it's a membrane based or, or something like that, and put the water back in the electrolyzer. Absolutely. You want to close as many loops as you can, and the water loop is is something we're interested in, and I know Electric A is very interested in. And Ron Ron Kent chimed in that uh, SoCal Gas R D D is also developing a technology that removes both water and CO two from the air. So yes. kind of two birds That's one right. stone there. That's right. All right. So um, Norvell Nelson has their hand raised. So Norvell, I will give you the opportunity to take yourself off of mute and ask your question. Okay. You may have lost them. All right. So that is all the questions that I see in the questions box. So let's do last call the questions from the audience, please. And Nancy's phone number is there if anyone wants to call her with questions. Uh, and I see Cynthia Carter has her hand raised. So why don't we give Cynthia a chance? Cynthia, if you can take yourself off of mute and you can ask a question. Hi, good morning, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, great. Yeah, thank you for the interesting uh, talk. Um, sorry, I was in and out of the meeting. So did you talk about a timeline as to when this kind of a technology goes into full development? Um, yeah, I, I didn't show a, a really good slide from Electric CAD because I didn't have space, but um, Doris put together uh, two, the two projects that they run over in Europe, one in Copenhagen, one in Switzerland, that are in the 500 kilowatt to one megawatt range. And then they also um, very kindly included our uh, reactor shown here on the same slide. So these pilot demonstrations, um, I, I think 
are setting the stage for the, the scale up. And Electric Chaos is working, has a project where they're defining a much larger system, perhaps up to 10 megawatts worth of electrolysis feeding a bioreactor. So, and I, and I don't know the full extent of all Electric Chaos leads. I know they get asked all the time about this, but uh, I suspect the first large scale system, perhaps 10 megawatts, um, is not very far off in, in the future. Doris could clarify if she's um, still on. I know it's late there, but it's happening and, and we will see a system here in the US um, in the not too distant future either. All right, great. Uh, yeah, Doris sends her greetings from Germany. Also, they are offering a commercial scale 10 megawatt system. Um, question from Greg Petrowski on recording, and that's a good reminder for the audience. A recording of the webinar will be made available. Uh, you should get an email uh, following the webinar, but it will also be available on the SoCal Gas RD&D website. And with that, I am not seeing any additional questions. So, Kevin, thank you so much for the presentation. I really appreciate it. I uh, really You're enjoyed welcome. it. This is super exciting technology, and we look forward to the next step uh, to see this uh, out in the field and producing RNG uh, to help California meet its decarbonization goals. Thank no, you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. And have a great morning, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.